bless your holy name continually. In your name we pray. Amen. Good morning, church. It is a pleasure to be with you today. Uh, today, the title of my sermon will be The Son of God versus the World. The Son of God versus the World. Now, one of the reasons I chose this title and I also chose the verse that Reagan read for us, uh, the reason I wanted to bring that up is to understand how the church works in the world how the church works in the world. We as a church have existed, the Christian church has existed for 2,000 years, from Christ's ascension to the modern day. And as we see in the Bible and in the book of Revelation, we see that there are many different stages and ages in church history. There are about seven. This is where we get the seven churches and the different seven seals, the different um, circular sevens in the book of Revelation. Many of these sevens are specifically talking about different ages in the church and in the world stage as a whole. Uh, what I'll be talking about today are the first three stages in church history or in the church ages. Uh, if we look at the church as a whole, we as a Christian church, since we've been around for so long, sometimes we often forget what our true purpose is and why we exist as a body of Christian believers. So let's really understand that. So if we look in church history, the first church, the first church as we know it, is the church that Christ gave to his apostles and his disciples. Now this is fully expressed in Pentecost when we read in Acts chapter two, when the Holy Spirit came down and came down with flaming tongues of fire and the apostles and the disciples were impassioned and enthralled and excited to preach the gospel of Christ. Now, these disciples in the first day on Pentecost baptized 3,000 members when they entered into the church, and they gained a great following after that. So the church in its early stages was very evangelistic and was very confident in its teachings and its understandings that Christ had given to them. And this is one thing that we often forget in the Christian church. We often forget that we are evangelistic. Christ gave us a great commission in Matthew chapter 28, where he says that go ye therefore into all the world and baptize in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and make disciples of all nations, teaching them what I have commanded you. So that is one aspect of the church that we often forget, but we need to employ or in, need to implement in our daily lives. A second aspect is the second series in the church age. The first church age happened from Christ's ascension, which is around the year 34, to the uh, year 100, that's around that time. But in the second church age is the second church age of great persecution. Um, this is expressed when we see in the book of Revelations with the horse, one of the four horsemen of the apocalypse as we see them. Uh, is bloody and he has an arrow, or he's bloody and death is following after him. And he goes out into all the world and many people suffer and die. In this period of the church, there is great persecution. In this era, there is tremendous death and suffering, a part of the Christian church. Um, one story to describe this is the story of a young woman named Hippolyta. Hippolyta was a young woman who lived in North Africa during the second or third century. Uh, she was a young woman who just converted to Christianity, and she was also a young mother who just had given birth to her child. Now, during the Roman persecution, the Christians proclaimed that only Jesus Christ was, in the Greek word, kurios. Kurios means Lord. Only Jesus Christ was Lord. However, in the Roman practice, what you would often say is that Caesar is curious, Caesar is Lord, and you had to sacrifice to different gods or to Caesar himself in honor of Caesar. However, the Christians would not do this. They would say, only Christ is Lord, we believe in only Jesus our Lord, not Caesar, Caesar is not Lord. So when Hippolyta was brought up to the altar to sacrifice to Caesar, she said, I will not, because I only serve my Lord Jesus. So they arrested her, 
and brought her into prison. Now she was just nursing her newborn child, so they allowed her newborn child to come into the prison with her. And her family visited her in prison and said, oh, just denounce Jesus, Jesus. Just say Caesar is Lord also, and Jesus is also Lord. But she did not. She gave her child to her mother and said, go with the child and I will stay here. So they put her in prison, kept her there, and then as tradition shows, uh, they brought her out to the Colosseum, and in the Colosseum they would have grand circuses and grand parties, and would put Christians inside the center of the Colosseum and would release animals, different bears or dogs or lions. And she was released into the center of the Colosseum and was devoured by the lions. Now this is a great story for the reason that we Christians who live in the modern age enjoy this freedom of religion, especially in America. Uh, this practice is not often seen in China or in North Korea or in different parts of Africa, uh, but we who are living in America are spoiled Christians who enjoy this freedom of religion. And we know during these tumultuous times that we live in, many things that we think that will stay the same forever never really do. So we may enjoy our freedom of practicing our religion, but we must also remember that many of these freedoms can be taken away. And we must be always vigilant and aware that we are people who are living in a place where, again, like my, servant said, my sermon title says, the Son of God versus the world. Satan is always operating in the world and is always operating to hurt God's church and hurts God's people. So we must be always vigilant and prepared. We must be like our fellow disciples back in those days, like Hippolyta, who was willing to confess that Caesar was not Lord, but only Jesus Christ was Lord. Now, going on, going on to the third stage in church history, this is where I'll be especially focusing on. This third stage is where the Christian church begins to be more and more accepted in the Roman Empire. This is where you have Constantine. He gains his victories, and he sees that the Christian God has given him this victory, so he adopts the Christian religion. But there's an interesting going on in Christianity at the time. Uh, in Christianity at the time, there is one major city that is very important to the, to Christianity, and that is Alexandria, Egypt. Alexandria, Egypt. Now, in Alexandria, there were two men. Two men, one man was named Athanasius, Athanasius, and another man was named Arius. Now, Athanasius was a very short, stocky man, not very rugged or handsome, uh, but was a good preacher and a good speaker for the church at Alexandria. And another person, uh, Arius, he was a tall, handsome, and also a good speaker, um, and also lived in Alexandria. But the two major differences between these two men was that Arius began to preach the idea that Christ was not the Son of God, eternally begotten from the Father. He was just a created being. He commonly went around preaching sermons and his common phrase was, there was a time where Christ was not. That was his title that he always go uh, preaching around. There was a time where Christ was not. He's pretty much saying there was a time where the second person in the Trinity, as we understand it, as we biblically understand it, did not exist. He believed that Christ was just created and was just a made person. While on the other hand, Athanasius believed in the biblical understanding that Christ is what we see in John 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And as you jump up to John 1 verse 14, and the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. Now, during that time, there was a great controversy in the church. The church was almost split in half. One group in the church believed that Christ was just a created being, not the divine Son of God, not equal to the Father. And another group of the church would believe the traditional biblical view that Christ is the eternal begotten Son of the Father. And one of, uh, of Arius' good friends was named Eusebius. He'll become important later. 
Now, since Constantine adopted Christianity, and he saw this situation was going on, like, why, why can't these Christians get this situation in order? So what he decided to do was organize a council, organize a meeting. This is what we know as the Council of Nicaea in the year 325. Now, the Council of Nicaea was a great debate. What was Christ? Who is Christ? Who is Jesus? This, is, this was the main debate. And this kind of harkens back to what we see in Matthew chapter 16, when Christ assembles all his disciples. And they come after uh, going witnessing all over Israel. And then Jesus asks his uh, disciples, who do people say that I am? And the disciples responded, well, some say that you're Elijah. Some say that you're uh, John the Baptist, come back from the dead. Some say you're Jeremiah or Isaiah. And um, Jesus asks Peter, like, what do you think I am? Who do you think I am? And then Peter replies, you are the Christ, the Messiah, the son of the living God. And this is what their debate is going on at the Council of Nicaea. Is Christ the son of the living God, eternally begotten from the Father? Now, Arius argued before the Council of Nicaea and argued that Christ was not. He was a created being. And he was very convincing and almost convinced the entire Christian church that Christ was not the word made flesh. But Athanasius, in his devotion to the scriptures and his devotion to the right understanding of Christ's divinity and also his humanity, proclaimed that Christ was the word made flesh. Now, at Nicaea, he convinced the entire church that Christ was God made in flesh or dwelt in flesh. And at the council, they decided this and said that we agree that Christ is God and Lord, and he is equal to the Father, while at the same time adopting human flesh. Now, Arius was seen as a person who was a heretic. He was kicked out of the church for his beliefs that uh, Christ was not equal to the Father. However, one of his friends, like I said, Eusebius, was a person who was very cunning. He said, okay, yeah, yeah, he's, he's God in the flesh. But he didn't really believe it. He just ascribed to it to cover his, uh, his bases to the people all around him. And now with the new king, the new Caesar, the new person who is going to be the uh, leader of Rome, needed someone to be a counselor someone to like train him up in understanding how the church operates. And who was given that job? Eusebius, Arius's friend. And Eusebius was very cunning. He taught to Constantine about Arius's views and kind of told Constantine, well, Athanasius was a little mean. Athanasius was, Athanasius was a little aggressive to Arius. It was too much. You should let him back in the church. It's OK. It's fantastic. It's fine. And Constantine was convinced of this. So Constantine announced that Arius would be allowed back into the church. Now Athanasius was furious. Like, oh, how can you let him back in? He still believes these views. He still holds these views. Constantine didn't like Athanasius' Athanasius's attitude. So Athanasius was kicked out of the church. So now Arius is let back into the church. Athanasius is kicked out. Now, what happens is there is a great assembly. There's a great ceremonial service for letting back Arius in to the church. Arius comes to the service. He says, well, before I go into the service, I need to go to the restroom. And he goes to the restroom. And the service goes on and on, but Arius doesn't come. The service goes on and on. Arius doesn't come. And then Eusebius says, where is Arius? So they know he's in the restroom. They go to the restroom. They open the door, and Arius is dead. From what? His bowels gave way to worms, the same way Herod died. His bowels gave way to worms, and he died. And the church afterwards saw this as a bad omen and let Athanasius back into the church. So can you say that God worked an action against Arius? I think so. And saved the church from going down a bad direction? Absolutely. God has done this multiple times 
in uh, church history, especially back in the Old Testament, when Jezebel was leading all the children of Israel back into Baal worship, he rose up Jehu to fight against her, and Jezebel was eradicated and left and died. So whenever evil things happen in God's church, God acts, God will intervene. And there are three things that we can gather from this understanding, this thing that happened in church history. There are three things. One of them is the importance of doctrine, the importance of doctrine. If we look at the understanding of the divinity of Christ, if we look at Christ's person, his nature, who he is as a person, it is essential to how we understand or practice our religion. When you taught your children from a little age to pray in Jesus' name, you told them that because Christ is God in flesh. If he was just a created being, then you're committing blasphemy. When we sing the songs, all hail the power of Jesus' name, let angels prostrate fall, why are they prostrating and falling to? To a created being who is not divine? No, they are worshiping the divine son of God. When we understand the passages in John chapter 8, when the Pharisees come before Jesus and says, who do you think you are? Who are you? And then Christ replies, before Abraham was, I am. And this applies to the divine name spoken in Exodus chapter 315. It says, before Abraham was, Yahweh. And in the Jewish context, in Jewish tradition, you are not even supposed to say the divine name. If you go before an Orthodox Jew in the modern day, you are not supposed to say Yahweh out loud to them. They, they feel uncomfortable that you're blaspheming. It's uh, taking the Lord's name in vain. So when Jesus said this, they picked up rocks to stone him because not only did he say the divine name, but he attributed the divine name to himself. So if Christ said he, if Christ said he was divine and he was lying, then we are lost. Because if he lied, that means he committed a sin. If he sinned, then we are without hope because he is no longer the spotless lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. So we must understand the importance of doctrine. Doctrine is essential in understanding our daily practices. Every, every doctrine that we have is woven into a, a, a particular tapestry. If you take out one of the strands, the whole thing unravels. If we understand the doctrine of scripture, uh, if we put together the doctrine of the Trinity, the doctrine of the Sabbath, the doctrine of, uh, of the Last Supper, all these different doctrines are like puzzle pieces that come together and form a beautiful image. So the doctrine is essential to our understanding of our religion. It is essential to our understanding of who we are as a people. People may say that they don't follow a particular religion, but people have their own individual doctrines that make up themselves. They have their own ideas. People say like, oh, I'm just a spiritual person. I'm like, well, you still follow certain things. Everyone follows certain things. It's whether those things are right to follow. The second thing that we can gather from this is to not follow the mob or the popular opinion. There is a uh, passage I remember from uh, Bible Bowl many years ago uh, in Exodus chapter 23, verse 2. You shall not follow a crowd to do evil, nor shall you turn aside after many to pervert justice. Following a crowd, following the mob. Now, when we see in our daily lives the popular opinion on specific topics, we Christians should not follow popular opinion for popular opinion's sake. The popular opinion could be correct, I'm not saying that, is that we Christians do not follow the mob just for the pleasure of the mob. We follow principles. We have um, ideas and set concepts. So whenever we see a conflict or a situation arise in our lives or in, the, in our daily relationships, we sit down and work them out in our heads. What has Christ said? What has God said in his word? How do these principles work with these principles? We sit down, we understand, and we use the rational faculties that God has given us, our reason that God has given us, and the scripture that God has given us, to make principled decisions. We do not follow mobs or popular opinion just for the popular opinion's sake, or just to make us feel good, because it feels good when you're part of the mob. You feel like a, a sense of a, 
of uh, in, enthrallment, excitement, because everyone in unison is kind of thinking the same thing. But we, we who are Christians are people who are um, counterculture by nature. Counterculture. They used to call it hippies in the 70s, counterculture. But we Christians are counterculture. We are counter the natural culture of the world. We think differently. We sit down. We rationalize. We look at our principles, and we make our solid decisions there. Sometimes the mob is right, but not all the time. That's why we have to sit down and make our rational principles uh, work out together. One last third thing is the greatness of Christ. The greatness of Christ. Christ is the greatest thing that has ever happened to this world. We know that and we understand that as Christians, not only in the spiritual level, but just in a understanding, in, even in a regular circular secular uh, circumstances. When uh, I think back to one of the greatest passages in the New Testament, I think back to the situation where the Pharisees bring the adulterous woman before Jesus. They bring the woman. They say, Lord, we caught this woman in adultery. This woman has committed a sin against the law. The law says that we should stone her. What do you say? Now, uh, if you're a conservative, what, we, what a conservative commonly thinks, like, well, if you just let her get away with adultery, everyone's going to do adultery. We, we commonly say this, uh, um, like, if you let it slide, then everyone's going to be able to do it. Kind of a, the slippery slope idea. But then usually a liberal would say, like, ah, just toss it out. It's just, it's just a law, whatever. You don't have to follow it. But neither thing is correct. What is correct is what Jesus did. What he did was that he kept the law but in installing love and mercy in the law. He kept the law while installing law, well, what, he kept the law while installing love and mercy in the law. So he said, one who is without sin, cast the first stone. He didn't get rid of the law. He didn't get rid of the statue, but he installed love and mercy. And the expressions that we see in our modern day about like certain ideas about morality, how we understand the world. It is the law, but combined with love and mercy. And that is what Christ has done to this world. That's his blessing to this world. And we can see the greatness of Christ in every aspect of our lives. Uh, if you are, even if you are a person who didn't stray away from Christ or has the dramatic story, you can see the love and kindness of Christ in your daily life. And one essential thing that we must remember is that Christ sits on his throne. He sits on his throne, conquered death and conquered sin. So when we see the tumultuous times that are going on with the coronavirus or racial strife in our cities or joblessness and unemployment, we know that Christ is still sitting on his throne. You may be sick or you may have lost a loved one, but Christ still sits on his throne you may see racial strife in the cities and feel afraid or uncomfortable, but Christ still reigns on his throne. You may see that you lost your job or you don't know how you're going to pay the next bill or how you're going to afford this medica medication, but Christ still sits on his throne. The confidence that we have is a confidence that we can rely on. In Hebrews chapter 6, it says that Christ is the anchor behind the veil. He is the anchor behind the veil. Commonly when we think of ships, we think of a ship and then you drop the anchor into the ocean. But this is kind of a upside down anchor. The anchor is up and the chain comes down. And each Christian is given an individual chain and is told to hang on and hold on tight. As Pastor Duncan always says, make sure you hold on to your rope and tie it and hold on even tighter. Christ is our anchor behind the veil. We can hold fast and hold tight to that anchor. And we know that Christ and his personality and who he is as a person has not only changed the world, but changed you, yourself. As a Christian, you must always realize the greatness of Christ and how he has changed your daily life. There's a common poem. It says, um, no army that has crossed any ocean, no 
king or president that has conquered any lands, no uh, people group that has waged war against this people group has done any greater thing greater than our Lord Jesus Christ. A person who walked just probably 200 miles in his life. A person who is from the backwoods of Galilee, from Nazareth. As Nathaniel said, can anything good come from Nazareth? Well, that one thing, that one excellent thing came from Nazareth, but he originally came from heaven above. We often sing the song, he came from heaven to earth to show the way from the earth to the cross, my debt to pay. Our Lord came from heaven and to earth to show us the way, to give us enlightenment and understanding of how we should live good and proper lives and show us love and mercy. And on the cross, he paid our debt. In the grave, he died for us, but he is risen from the dead and he reigns in heaven and is our king forever. Now we know that we have the love of Jesus we know that we have the love of Christ because we know his promises are sure, that he's not a liar, that he is true and faithful. And we know that Christ gave that adulterous woman love and mercy, and he's able also to give us love and mercy. And we know that Christ is God and that God is love. Let us pray. Our Father in heaven, we thank you, Lord, for everything you've done for us. We thank you, Lord Jesus, for being our, interce our interceder, Lord, intercessor. We love you, Lord Christ, because you first loved us. We know that you are coming soon again to bring us home, and we know, Lord Jesus, that you love us. You love each and every one of us, and you are, you are our anchor. You give us strength each and every day, you love us. Lord, we know throughout the ages in the Christian uh, ages, Lord, you are with your disciples. You are with Hippolyta during that persecution time. You are with your church during that time with Athanasius, Lord. You are with your church during the dark ages where everything seemed to be lost. You are with your church during the Reformation. You are with your church during the great disappointment and you are with your church continually now. Be with your church continually until the end of the ages, until we come and be with you forever, so that we may be with the source of love, the source of goodness and truth and mercy forever and ever. May your name be praised always, now and forevermore. Amen. Wow, we have got a great heart.